Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast, your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate, one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Dr. Eli Karam back with you on another edition of the AAMFT podcast. Another highly requested topic today. When you think of theories that go with MFT, like peanut butter and jelly, you think of attachment. Sometimes we think of attachment in the context of working with couples. Um, Sue Johnson's emotionally focused therapy. However, today we're talking about how do we take this great universal concept of attachment and attachment-based relationships and apply them to working with families, specifically families and really troubled teens, which is still very common as the identified patient presenting to family therapy. And no better to do that than, uh, again, a real pioneer as far as scientists, practitioners in this work, part spiritual, uh, part academic, part researcher, part musician, Guy Diamond. Let me tell you about Guy. He is a professor emeritus from University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and currently an associate professor at Drexel in the College of Nursing and Health Professions. At the D- Drexel, he is the director of the Family Intervention Science and the director of the PhD program in Couple and Family Therapy. Family Intervention Science was founded in 1996 and has re- received funding from NIMH, SAMHSA, and several other private foundations. Family Intervention Science is dedicated to development, testing, and dissemination of attachment-based therapy, uh, attachment-based family therapy, sometimes abbreviated as ABFT, and that's what we're going to be talking about today with Dr. Diamond, specifically ABFT with depressed and suicidal youth. Uh, This approach has been rigorously tested in several clinical trials and process research studies, and now enjoys the distinction of being an empirically supported treatment on SAMHSA's list. Dr. Diamond is also the lead developer of the Behavioral Health Screening Tool, and that's a web-based tool for mental health and non-mental health settings. Uh, And he's often featured with his co-authors, Dr. Gary Diamond, no relation, we'll talk a little bit about that, and Susan Levy. Dr. Diamond has written the first book on attachment-based family therapy, which is a a must-have if you're into attachment or working with teenagers and their family, and that's called Attachment-Based Family Therapy for Depressed Adolescents, uh, published by APA. This is a great interview. He has an amazing story, and uh, if, if you've never heard about attachment-based family therapy, you're going to get a great overview, and if you do, you're going to learn about really, really one of the founding pioneers behind it. I got to spend a lot of time with Guy uh, that led up to this interview, we were both honored by AMFT. He's also the 2018 uh, Cumulative Career Achievement Award winner from the AAMFT. Here he is, Dr. Guy Diamond. All right, pleased to be joined on the AAMFT podcast by Dr. Guy Diamond. So one of the most requested topics we have gotten is attachment. It's like attachment and family therapy. That's like peanut butter and jelly. So when I think of attachment uh, in families, I think of Guy Diamond. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Guy. And the first thing I ask all of our guests, just general, to kind of know the man behind the model, what got you interested in family therapy to start with? Kind of your origin story. Well, that's an interesting story. Um, I actually grew up in a family that was deep in the humanistic psychology movement in the 70s. My mother was a 
not a psychologist herself, but she was actually one of the organizers, the behind the scenes. We were, she ran a growth center in Los Angeles. She got offered the job to run Eslin Institute for anybody old enough to remember that. But you know, this is with the the epicenter of humanistic psychology in those days, and and uh, I grew up surrounded by that, thinking, oh, for sure, I'm going to grow up and become a psychologist. And then when I was 18, I took a year, actually two years off from going to college. I was playing in a rock and roll band in Los Angeles and thought I was going to be the next Phil Collins. I was the drummer. Uh, and then got a little uh, itchy to do something a little bit bigger and, and do some traveling and went to Europe and ended up going to Israel and got a little smitten with Orthodox Judaism. Really? Wow. Yeah. So what? So uh, our timeline, what are you like, how old are you? At this I'm time? now, this is 19, or maybe 20, damn, uh, maybe, no, I, I think I turned 21 on that trip while I was in Greece. So I go to Israel, you know, not looking for anything particular, but you, you sit in Jerusalem by the Wailing Wall and these, you know, these rabbi guys come up to you and say, hey, you look pretty tired, you wanna come home for a dinner? And you say, wow, that's free food, that sounds great. And they take you to a yeshiva, where it's a school for lost Jewish boys, a bunch of you know college dropout kids trying to figure out who the hell they were. And and uh, you know it was just so a you, really- So you go on this by yourself, you don't go with yeah. a bunch of buddies, wow. Yeah, no, I'm on this journey all alone. And, but it's a soul-searching group of kids. It's, you know, we're reading and studying Bible and arguing Talmud. And it was just a really invigorating. And for me, and, and stop me if I'm going on too long on this, but f for me, it was a complete counterpart to humanistic psychology in the 70s, which was so relativistic and do your own thing. and discover yourself and Carl Rogers this and Fritz Perls that and and I loved the structure and the idea that there was actually uh, meaning in life beyond my own sense of purpose and uh, I got really smitten by Judaism and came back to America and and uh, and then for years sort of toyed with whether I was going to be a psychologist or a rabbi and, you know, though they had a lot of similarities. Yes, both relational healers. Both yes. healers. Uh, I got really drawn to the kind of community dim dimension of being a rabbi, that rather than working with individuals and self-growth, you kind of took on a whole town and a whole community of people and had a more prevention orientation. And, uh, and I, I like that. And so after college, I actually ended up going to rabbinical school. I studied in Berkeley for a year and then went to uh, the conservative seminary in, in uh, New York, JTS, and just hated it and found myself in the midst of a very dry, academic, rule-driven and I really, I, the day I really realized I shouldn't be there is when the professor said, so you sh you're going to enroll in Columbia's business school, aren't you? And I said, well, why would I do that? He says, because that's what rabbis do. You run a business. You raise money. You handle budgets. You. And I knew at that point I was in the wrong place. It, it was about 180 degrees difference from the yeshiva. I regrouped, went back to California, went to a master's program. Uh, an MFCC program, very politically minded. A guy named Michael Lerner ran it. So you'd have a you know a class on family development, and it would be a, from a Marxist perspective. <laughs> Is that the first time you found out about systemic thinking and systemic language? It it was, and the turning point was uh, I took a class, an intro to family therapy, with Guillermo Bernal, who's a well-known figure in our field and uh, you know started seeing this family therapy tapes and st feeling very drawn to that and and uh, I was actually you know like many of us the the family therapist in my family and I come from a pretty chaotic 
broken home with a lot of turmoil and trauma and played a big role later in my life of dragging everybody into therapy to try to figure out who we were and could we get along better and could we get over the traumas of the past and find a new way to be together and so we're talking about attachment style today. So obviously you, we only know our blueprint is our family of origin and what we grow up in. So, I mean, obviously you didn't have that attachment framework at that time, but I'm curious how you discovered that and then how you would describe your own attachment style and yeah. your family of origin. I mean, I've come in from my family. I probably had a primarily and still struggle with a kind of disengaged dismissive sort of attachment style you know I, I would be fine you know living in a monastery on my own you know reading books and I, I, I can get drawn to solitude too easily you think and that it, was your reaction to the chaos in your family yeah just oh to, yeah. yeah it was like a deer in the headlights it was so I was just kind of blanked out froze you know couldn't couldn't handle emotional intensity because it, I my my nerve endings were so singed by the chaos of my family that I you went internal I went internal which became a huge self of the therapist issue when I started doing family therapy which I can say a little bit more of when I just so so I was watch, sitting in that class watching, you know, Mnuchin and Haley and uh, Ivan Naj, you know, do this magic, this kind of healing, this creating opportunities for people to say things they never said or be people they never could be. And it just touched a core in me. And it kind of was sort of, okay, I'm not going to be a rabbi, but I could be a family community rabbi. And, and I, think, I think my work is rabbinical, if I had to. Yeah, in spirit, right, sure. In spirit, I think people see me teach, and, and that's, that's what they come away with, a kind of inspired, almost spiritual renewal of family connectedness so you you found a way uh to marry the two these two very powerful experiences in your life so how, how did you discover attachment well one piece of that in in guillermo's class he announces he got a research grant to do contextual family therapy with, what year are we now guys just so we're, I, i'm probably 26 and, uh, you know, this is how your life changes on a dime. I walked up to him after class and said, that sounds kind of cool, not knowing what it was. And do you need any help? And he said, as a matter of fact, I'm looking for a research assistant. And he hired me and my life just turned on a 90 degree angle. And I became deeply impassioned about doing family therapy treatment research. And I just brought those two interest together in a way that's colored my whole career yes and this is on the ground floor of our timeline too mft for years you know it's like go and watch us uh, do a live dazzling demo and we'll get our uh followers that way but uh, you know as we know good therapy is both art and a science and you were in the ground floor of the science of empirically supported treatments everybody else so it's literally uh, a chance guillermo offered offered you the opportunity and you said i want to do that so yeah. you had never thought about being a researcher before I, that i didn't even know what it was you know i just thought oh you're gonna make training tapes like that i want to do that <laughs> I want to be part of those kind of things. Well, I, I think most most of us that are scientists, practitioners have a similar experience. Everything I've ever thought about studying has been uh, directly influenced by what I saw in the therapy room. So it's no, no different <laughs> yeah, than right. you. All right, so then... Uh, so I'm working, then I get a next job with Howard Little, who's really I owe everything to. He was... I, and, I, and I've developed a deep appreciation for mentorship, having worked with him. He's just really changed my life and made me believe in myself and create a vision about who I could be. And, but we're seeing families, we're seeing, it was uh, his work, multidimensional family therapy with substance abusing teens. And, and these families are just screaming at each other and you, you sort of sit back and say, I, I don't quite get it, you know, you're, 
you're screaming at your mom about your room or your curfew. It just doesn't match up. You know, what? what's going on behind this argument that's really driving this much hostility? And it was really trying to look at those kinds of moments in therapy, a kind of shift from behavioral management, from organizational issues, from parenting practices, to really kind of getting a feel of, wow, there's some undercurrent here of pain, of betrayal, of, of uh, uh, trauma, the ways in which kids will never forgive their parents for what their parents did to them. And, uh, and that, it, it really began to think more about this sort of inner life of people and how these inner experiences were playing out in the interaction between people. And the attachment framework just started to emerge as a way to explain some of that, you know, why people are so hurt and, you know, feel so rejected and then how they internalize that and how they then bring that into relationship and attachment theory just increasingly began help me understand that. Okay, and then I mean, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, Sue John, we had Sue Johnson on the podcast, and she was saying that Bowlby wanted to call you know attachment theory the theory of love, but but he didn't think people would take it seriously. So it is just such a intuitive framework, I think, for us all to understand. So then you you found that, and then again Howard Little, who as you said had his own uh, has his own great program of research with multidimensional family therapy, and then you kind of broke out on your own and started your own. A uh, very strong line of research, which is what we're here about talking about today, about attachment-based family therapy. How did you make the jump to start doing your own? You thing? know, I, I, I was uh, lucky enough to get an internship. I had my Ph.D. in psychology, and I got an internship at the Philadelphia Chug Guidance and felt like I got the spark. You know, I, I mean, Mnuchin and Haley and Montalvo were all gone, but... The second generation, John Sargent, John Bremler, Joe Macucci, I mean, people who had all trained under them were still there, and the spirit was deep and alive, and, and uh, it just made a huge imprint on me. And I started working on the inpatient unit and found myself surrounded by depressed and suicidal adolescents. And then we started a project where we sat down at lunch every day for a month and said when a case goes well what what are some of the common elements what's what's common about a successful case and and that was really the beginning of starting to think about the kind of task structure that we use the initial relational reframe how do you get families to agree to a, a relational focused therapy rather than a behavior management or a symptom reduction therapy and you know we then we felt like how do you how do you build an alliance with the adolescent in a way that's not only makes them trust you but allows you to help them articulate sometimes for the first time their own deep narrative about who they are and why they're in so much pain and why they're so angry and you know what we now call the attachment narrative in our work how to how to help them put all that into words how to help them tolerate the emotions that go along with it that's really what that task is about but we also knew that in family therapy you had to have an alliance with the parent so we started to think a lot about what are we doing with parents that would help bring them along to make them more emotionally vulnerable, more empathic about their child's hurts and burdens, and help them become more attachment-promoting parents rather than angry, rather than guilty, rather than dismissive, rather than critical, that they really could tolerate kids' pain. They could be a more of a holding environment for kids. and. We do a lot of intergenerational work with them. We do a lot of focus on current stressors, refer a lot of them to therapy on their own. And But we're, our goal is to make them available so that when we bring people back together in what we call task four, this attachment task, kids can turn to their parents for support, comfort, and validation. What yeah. were the biggest eye-openers and the biggest challenges early on in doing that work? I think 
Um, you know, it's two things. I think the two cornerstones of our work are uh, being able to conceptualize the case from an attachment framework and really understanding the intergenerational legacies of attachment failure and how that pain is showing up in behavioral problems in front of you and trying to hang on to that you know you want to you find yourself wanting to side with the kid when the truth is the parents are often in as much pain as the kids are and if you don't lean in and embrace that and hold them and heal them <clears throat> it's harder for them to be available to their kid and i think just trying to learn how to maintain an attachment frame think about everything we what we say is that most parents their intention is good. They want to love their kid. They want to take care of their kid. But sometimes the way they go about it doesn't work very well. And we, we say that to parents in the room, and, and that's sort of our... We constantly believe in parents' goodwill to be a, a, a parent, and it really comes out of Bowlby's kind of instinctual caregiving instinct. But for a long time, I felt like, because I started working in the Department of Psychiatry and started writing NIH grants and, you know, psychiatry and psychology sort of became my professional home. That's who I went to conferences and training with. And even though I'd grown up with Howard in the AAMFT community, that's where I got started. Yeah, you kind of had dual citizenship, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> dual citizen, I like that term, yeah. But for a long time, I felt like, you know, I don't. what do I have to teach family therapists? They know all this already. They're already doing this work. If I go to AAMFT and get up and show my stuff, people will say, yeah, sure, we've been doing that for years, whereas I felt psychiatry was something new. And, so, and when I started going back to family therapy, I, I found out that that wasn't the case and that, in fact... You know, family therapy, and I'm, you know, I say with the deepest respect because I love this tradition, but it has sort of tilted towards a more behavioral. It's actually interesting. You know, the narrative tradition is a quite psychological tradition, but as I always say, it's it's kind of as Mnuchin said, it it sort of lost the interactional dimension. It's it's more an individual kind of conversation with about one's cognitions and attributions and whereas a lot and then a lot of family therapy is more behavioral sort of working with interactions and trying to change behaviors and and people started to feel like oh guys guys kind of helping us refocus on something more i don't want to say profound but more m meaningful more interpersonal pain more about trauma, more about love, more about safety and protection, and and uh, and I found I, I I found my work more valued than I thought it would be. There's the people who listen to this podcast who have many young therapists in training, preclinical fellows that. Uh, would like to learn more. And then we'll also have seasoned family therapists that when they went to graduate school, there was not uh, empirically support treatments or they've heard about attachment-based family therapy, but they don't, they didn't get trained in it. What, if, if you had to distill attachment-based therapy down, uh, it's kind of like, a, you know, a, a summary of the model uh, to wet the whistle of our listeners. How would you describe it? On the one hand, we are guiding people to focus on the internal landscape of people and how that shows up in the interaction of people. And I think there's that brings a depth to the work. In that regard, it's very trauma-focused. It's very process-focused. Um, and there's a lot of, and as I learned from Howard, a lot of preparation, a lot of working with individuals to help them come to understand things about themselves before bringing them back into enactment with each other. So I think it goes to the, I think it is a therapy about love and it's a therapy about pain 
and it's a therapy about working through traumas that have gotten in the way of trust. On the other hand, what's interesting about it is I think we have taken, you know, what could be a, you know, a pretty mushy, process-oriented, you know, kind of, you know, depth-oriented therapy, and we've given it a lot of structure, and we've built a scaffold around it that allows even some of the beginning therapist to say, oh, here's what I should be doing, and here's where I'm going, and here's what I want to accomplish, and here's five ways I can try to accomplish it, and here's a bunch of decision rules about what I do if it's not working, and where I turn, and how I go. And So I, I think on the one hand, it's very deep in its focus, and on the other hand, it has a lot of guidance and uh, even my young therapists in training come out of sessions and say, I, I can't believe I got into this conversation with this family. And it's because we have sort of, I think we've in some ways, I'm not sure how well I'm answering your question, but uh, in some ways, and, and uh, you know, I don't, I, I think in some ways we have operationalized what good therapy is. A lot of people come up and say, I've been doing therapy 20 years and you nailed it. You do exactly what I do. You think about what I think about. You go after the things I think about. But you do it in 12 weeks and it takes me a year. And I think that's what ABFT is really. It's mapped out some of the key elements of what it takes to do a deep interpersonal heartfelt trauma-informed therapy, but to keep it focused enough that it can move along in a relatively brief period of time. When, as you started uh, getting grants and publishing research, because again, one of the things that distinguishes this uh, second generation uh, f family therapy from, you know, these descendants of which it came from, you know, the, the, it's very experiential based, but it has a, uh, empirical basis, which is again, the, the science behind the art. What, what have we learned from the research about uh, attachment based family therapy that, that really has added to the science behind the art of psychotherapy yeah. and family therapy? Well, I think in part, you know, we've, we've done two types of research. One is outcomes research, where we try to figure out, is this therapy working? And we measure some depression before it starts. And then when the therapy's over, we measure it again and say, was there any change? And I think we have done a nice job at showing this model can reduce depression. It can reduce suicidal thinking. It can improve family functioning. Um, and it, so we've, we've sort of demonstrated. I think part of my, I'll come back to the second part in a sec, but part of my professional passion has been to keep family therapy on the map. And that if it weren't for people like Scott Engler and Howard Little and Jim Alexander uh, and others, you know, who, who were doing the research, family therapy would increasingly be marginalized in the current healthcare environment, not be funded by SAMHSA, and, you know, increasingly not be funded by insurance companies. In Europe, if, you know, Sweden, England, Germany, if you don't have empirical data behind your model, they don't reimburse for it. You don't have a seat at the table. You do not have a seat at the table. So, you know, whether my model's the only one or whether, you know, there's other ways to approach family therapy, I, I've been trying to keep family therapy on the list. Oh, yeah, here's a, here's a model that works. And, and I think initially I was, you know, one of the few people doing depression work and still I'm one of the few people doing suicide work because a lot of our empirical tradition with adolescence has been more focused on um, externalizing disorders, though obviously there's tremendous work in eating disorders and the Maudsley group has done an amazing job. And So it was really about could, you know, all the 
depression and suicide work was cognitive behavioral and medication focused. And I think we have kind of helped put family therapy into the mix. You know, when they write the review papers now, we're always listed as one of the, you know, efficacious treatments. You know, when they list the treatments that should be promoted and funded by SAMHSA, we're on the list. And that, that's been a, it's that really kind of out of my love. You know, maybe it's like my family, you know, I'm trying to save my family from falling apart. And I think I've had a kind of sentimental commitment to demonstrating that family therapy works. Well, it's, it's true. And if we don't have people like you and those others you mentioned, I mean, we would not have a seat at the table and you, you have to prove what you do works. And the only way I know how to do that is outcome research. So that, that, that is important at getting a seat at the table. But as a clinician, what I love uh, is also process research about the how change unfolds in a room, how, how you build that alliance, how you, uh, you know, help families and individuals deal with these attachment wounds, these pain and uh, opposing emotions of pain and love. Talk about the other type of, of research that has come in addition to outside uh, right. outcome research from attachment-based family therapy. Right, and so that's what I would say is sort of really the second half of my empirical career. You know, we, you know, since working with Howard, you know, I think he gave me that value set working with people like Paul Kurtz Christoph at Penn and big people in the general psychotherapy field, we have been deeply committed to uh, psychotherapy process research. And Gary Diamond, who, who's not blood brother, but an academic soulmate. I remember know. when I when I started reading about you long before I met you, I would confuse. I, was like, I is know. Is that Gary Diamond and Guy Diamond? It's the know. same person. Both I... G's. I, I get credit for his work all the time, believe me, <laughs> he, he hates it. <laughs> but we, we, we have done, and he's really led a lot of this, some really systematic process research that is about the funnest thing you could ever do in your life, you know. It's coming up with a coding system, you know, what am I, what, what's good about therapy and what's bad about therapy, and how can I put that in a coding system, and how can I train people to watch tapes and code these different variables and then make, you know, uh, interpretations. It actually is what gave me my, I think, my deep sensibility about therapy process as a therapist. You know, for my dissertation, I actually did my first process study. I think both papers were published in, in Family Process. And, uh, no, actually, one was in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical, and then one was in Family Process. But I, it's actually interesting, though, that episode I was talking about where people would be screaming at each other, and I'd sit back and say, what, what are you really angry about? And out would come these interpersonal attachment ruptures and trauma stories and how we'd help the family shift to those topics. And I, for my dissertation, I found... 12 examples of that from my study with Howard and I sat down with a pot of coffee this at my at uh, Philadelphia Child Guidance Center I would come home at night I had transcribed all these tapes so I would have the transcript going on one screen and the video on another screen and on a third screen I would be writing what happened? Why did he say that? Oh, that's interesting. Oh, let's go back. That why did he? He could have. What did he mean to say there? What? Why did he? The kid was crying and he didn't say anything. What? Why not? He should have. And it was this sort of textual analysis of a therapy session that I think gave me honed my ability to think in subtle ways in therapy, and I think it's an amazing training tool. I wish all the programs were encouraging students to do process research. I mean, a treatment can be efficacious, it can be effective, but if I, on the front lines, as a frontline family therapist or clinician, can't get access to it, it can't really be disseminated. So talk about the dissemination of attachment-based family therapy, and if, if, I'm a, if I'm out there and I wasn't trained in this, I want to know more about it, where do I go? So that's a very interesting dimension and, and, you know, definitely more of the focus 
of my career work at this point, you know, we've done a lot of development, we've done a lot of validating and testing, and you're you're exactly right. The question now is, well, okay, how how does it go out into the world, and how do people learn it, and how do people use it, and does it change practice in the real world, and so we, you know, we've been involved with a number of efforts. Obviously, the writings that we do, we hope people read the book we wrote about the model has gotten a lot of praise and continues to have an impact it's very clinical it's very you know it's, it's a lot about what you say rather than some conceptual model about how to think about therapy it's at this juncture you'd say this and you might say this and then I would move you know so it's a very practical book we've written a number of case study papers that I also think give uh, a good feel for the model. Uh, JMFT published one a couple of years ago, and you know we have a number of other clinical papers. The, out. the best books they are. They are like living manuals, and that if you read it, it's almost like watching a video of of what to do and how to do it. And I do think that is part of the appeal of your model. I've certainly have have read the book, and it is a very practical. You can read the book and and envision doing the work in the room. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, I'm glad I, I take that as high compliment coming from you. But the, but the other elements, there's still questions of dissemination. And, you know, we do a lot of training. We go around the country and do workshops. And, um, you know, we've partnered with a lot of organizations that bring us out. And we go to Cincinnati and we do a three-day training and train the agency that brought us out. And, and the old training model has been very, you know, it's, you know we do a lot of it. Uh, how pervasive it is, how well a weekend workshop does to change practice is still a, a big empirical question that hasn't been well examined. Uh, so there's two other dissemination strategies we are exploring. One of them is um, a lot of the dissemination work the funded by NIH has been to take uh, model CBT, DBT, uh, out into community mental health centers and try to change the way therapists practice. The real world, yes. The real world, right. You know, there's so many challenges in the community mental health world. Lack of funding, staff turnover, uh, you know, therapists who don't have a lot of training. Uh, so it's, it's been a hard road. One of the things that has interested me is trying to develop a training program that actually backs its way into uh, master's level education. One of the things that has surprised me, and although I had a lot of conversations and there are a lot of reasons to explain it, but the lack of uptake of empirically supported treatments in the master's and PhD programs in the family therapy world you know, I still go to conferences, you know, until I got this award, I would go to conferences and people still didn't know who I was and didn't know of my work. Oh, yeah, I, I think we read that once in a, you know, one day in a class I was in. And, and it just struck me how little the empirically supported treatments were getting attention in the master's and PhD programs. I know that the guidelines, I think, what is it, not... not uh, what is it, something 12 that's come out now? Yes, the accreditation standards. Accreditation yes. standards. There's now a requirement to teach the empirically supported treatment. So there's more review paper, review classes on that cover EFT and MDFT. And, but for a lot of years, it was nothing. So anyway, we've tried, we're have we trying to develop curriculum for a master's program and where we would create a, a six-week or a, a, a ten-week quarter or a sixteen-week semester, we would we're creating the entire course for a professor. Our assumption is these professors are smart people. They've been doing this work a long time. <clears throat> if we gave them the resources, here's a syllabi, here's a reading list, here's a weekly exercises, here's some videotapes, examples of the elements that we're trying to teach that they could actually pick up that curriculum and incorporate it into their, into their program of training. 
So obviously listeners of this podcast are, are co empty program directors and educators too. So if that if that what's your whistle? Is this in development or is there already a place I can go if I'm uh, teaching in a master's level program and get access to this stuff? Yeah, we, uh, we're halfway finished with the product, but it is slated to uh, go out into about six programs in the fall. How do you do it at Drexel there? Uh, how do you do it in-house? We have a, it's a mix. We have a class. You know, I've, I've taught it as a class. A court, we were on quarter systems. The ideal model is I have a course. It's a three hour a week class. We do a lot of, uh, you know, reading, hands-on role plays, you know, really trying to get the conceptual framework. But the students also participate in a practicum program with me. And in our student clinic, they're picking up cases and getting weekly supervision about how to do the model. And we're actually doing that our first full year this year. And uh, students will get a full year of training in ABFT and supervision with me. and. You know, they actually complete almost all of the work that would qualify to get credentialed as a as an ABFT therapist. The ease of dissemination, as far as books, as far as training programs, is very important, and that is clearly where a lot of your passion lies. Again, you have this dual. Uh, role as, as, as both scientist and practitioner. You, you led us into what your early life was like. How do you balance your time now between, you know, doing supervision, clinical practice, and allotting your time to, to continue doing research? I always, always wonder, most of the model developers we've interviewed on the podcast, they're passionate. They love the work. There's, they can't take the therapist out of them. They, they still find a way to do it. And I've never asked you how much you still actually do the work. I mean, my sort of clinical work ebbs and flows depending on, you know, cases that come along and, and uh, what's going on in my life that quarter. And I'm, I just picked up three new cases last week that I'm seeing in private practice. And, uh, you know, what I really love is training. I think my deepest passion lies in trying to translate the science that we've done into how to teach therapists, how to, how to give them a conceptual framework that can guide what they do and then how to give them the tools in the room. A, a, lot, of, a lot of therapists we talk to at the master's level and, you know, the AA master's programs, you know, it's hard to do everything, but um, students tell us they get a lot of good overview. They get good theory. But there's not a lot of teaching about what do I actually do in the room? You know, how do I engage a difficult parent? You know, how do I develop a attachment thematic frame of the therapy? And, and I think that's what we love doing, sort of. It comes from that process research orientation, you know, how to, how to actually do the therapy in the room and, and trying to train therapists both through live supervision and tape review and case conceptualization and... Uh, I think that's, you know, what I'd like to be thinking about doing most in the next, you know, coming years, these different dissemination models, different training models, and uh, trying to focus on that. And uh, yeah, the, you're reading my mind. That was one of my questions of kind of the next phases of ABFT. And then, you know, when you think of, you've had this really sharing your personal stories is what a kind of diverse background you've had that's led you to where you are and i am curious you talked about that family of origin i uh, always ask the model developers is like does your family kind of realize what you've done uh, have you are they are they kind of uh, when you got honored and for uh, 2018 by amft did they realize that or is that kind of your own thing and you don't you don't talk about it with your uh, with your family you know, I had a mother who you were never good enough for, so as many of us, too many of us, she wanted me to go get an MBA and couldn't understand why I was doing this other she, stuff. She was with the rabbis. Yeah, she was. So, and both of my parents have now passed. I, I think they, I think my father, I think both parents, I was not destined to be an academic when I was a kid. No, you certainly did not have a direct route. No. I did not have a direct route, and and uh, and I think both my parents. 
I don't think they were around long enough to see my accomplishments as a as a model developer and clinical trainer in that regard. I don't I don't think they ever understood that level of accomplishment. But the the fact that I became a associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania, they were they would constantly say you know, it is unbelievable that you've arrived here. And so, so I'd get some recognition from them. I think it's still more my own problem. You know, I think I still, that's why I was, I have to say it was, it was I'm, I'm, I'm tearing up if you were, see, getting that award was like, oh my God, you mean, really? I I have something of value to offer you and you, you, you like me? It's <laughs> sort of thing, yeah. You know, this is kind of a legacy question. You have you know, many, many more years to go in your career, and you're still as passionate and, and vibrant after listening to you this hour as, as you've always been about your work. But, but how do you want to be remembered by the field? And in this case, the field, even though you have dual citizenship, uh, by, by marriage and family therapist. Definitely. I, I feel like I've, I feel like Siddhartha, who's come home to AAMFT and feel deeply committed to this profession of family therapy and what it can become and you know what how what I how I can bring things back to it so I think I guess two things I was thinking of is um, that I that I have brought some heart back to family therapy that I that I've helped initiate or, or continue a conversation about how family therapy can touch the very core of who people are and help them work through the deepest pains that they have rather than be a kind of solution focused approach or a you know a structural behavioral kind of approach that that family therapy can can be a depth oriented you know therapy that can really get to the very heart of the matter in people and and be you know not just solve problems but really be transformative for people and help them discover pieces of themselves and relationships with each other that they never thought possible before and i I would be touched if people say, oh, yeah, a guy helped us think about that. And, and also building on what you said earlier, I mean, like, I like to think of it. Yes, it is depth, but you can also operationalize depth and you can train people in depth. And you, there could be a science behind the art. And what, what we do as relational healers is certainly artful. But when I, I think of a model like this and, you know, some, you know, when people look back at early family therapy experiential models. Well, there's only one Virginia Satir. There's only one, there's only one Carl Whitaker. But no, this is a, an evolution of that uh, in a way that can be taught and trained. And that's when I heard you say yeah, your passion is training because that, that is where it needs to go. I mean, uh, it's been great, you know, listening to you this hour. And I think you, it, it's so, you know, I hope this is a different type of interview than you've done before because learning about the, the interventions and the steps of a model is very important and you can you can find that a lot of places. But hearing the story behind the person, I think, is, is we're all relational at heart, I think is very, very important. And I learned some things about you that I did not know. So I thank you so much for being part of the podcast. I want you to be able to kind of... Uh, plug anything you want at the end again if i'm a talk about the book again and the website where they can find out or any listener can find out where where these abft trainings are at uh you know yeah i i think the book is continues to be the the cornerstone statement of what we do um you know that we do have websites uh, abft training center at drexel.com I think if you Google my name, most of that stuff comes up. And, and uh, you know, we really welcome input. We just love training therapists. They love the work when we come out. It just resonates so deeply with everybody who we work with. And, you know, I just hope we can continue to spreading the word and training people and bringing this kind of depth back to family therapy. Thank you so much for your time, Guy. It was great yeah. talking to you. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity. and uh, It's been-
been great talking. Thanks. So brings to a conclusion another great installment of the AAMFT podcast. And that one had a little bit of everything. It was fairly a man for all seasons, Guy Diamond. And whether you're interested in learning more about the model, attachment-based family therapy, or you're just really into an interesting story of we all, family therapists all have an interesting story of how they got to do the work that they do and certainly um, a unique pathway that Guy took um, to the world of MFT. Always, if you want to dig deeper, AMFT has you covered. Uh, many people have had the experience of coming to a national conference, which is great. And if you can't go to AMFT, AMFT will come to you from the comfort of your own home or home office, wherever have you, through Tenio. Again, Tenio is the online learning portal that will give you the most current, up-to-date education and research in the field of systemic therapy. So if you want to find out more, you can go to Tenio and can search for Guy Diamond, and you'll see Emotion Deepening Techniques and Attachment-Based Therapy which is a presentation by Guy Diamond and Jody Russin. And it's all about ABFT uh, and how ABFT uses attachment theory to facilitate conversations about core ruptures that are blocking parent-child trust. You'll learn about emotioning deepening techniques that are essential to creating meaningful change experiences in this attachment-based therapy. And, you know, you'll see a combination of lecture and role play and discussion that will describe this meta framework the guy talked briefly about and teach eight core emotional deepening techniques as always amft tenio your one-stop shop for continuing education i'd love to hear from you on the podcast Uh, we are driven by listener feedback both in our guests uh, pioneers in the field and also emerging in hot topics like attachment-based family therapy. Please drop us a line at communications at aamft.org. You can reach me directly at info at elikaram.com. That's E-L-I-K-A-R-A-M. Also, follow the conversation on Twitter. The hashtag is the AMFT podcast. AMFT is at the AMFT. I'm at Dr. Eli Live. Please listen to us wherever you find your favorite podcast. Partial to Apple Podcast. And if you go there, please leave us a star rating and a review. It really helps us rise up the ranks in mental health podcast. Whether you've been listening since the start in January or you just found us. <laughs> I don't want to be the best kept secret uh, in mental health podcasts, so please spread the word. Whether you're a member of the AMFT or you're just interested in systemic therapies or working with couples and families, you have found us at the right place. As always, until next time, stay systemic.